our series though this week called Three Little Words. And, and we've been talking about it for the uh, last couple weeks. We started out talking about faith and, and how it's our goal that we each grow in our faith with God and also that we inspire others to grow in their faith in God. And then last week we talked about hope and how we're in a world that, that seems hopeless in so many ways and how we want to inspire people to have hope. And we want to inspire people that are depressed and anxious and fearful that tomorrow is a new day, that we have a God who loves us. And so, so that was those two weeks. And, and all of this kind of came from 1 Corinthians 13. Verse 13, it's the last verse in this chapter. And it says, three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. And, and we normally we read this verse at, at weddings because we, we all feel nice and warm and fuzzy and we want to read about love, so we read this. But this last verse really stood out to me, that it's not just one thing, love, but there's three things that it's talking about, faith and hope and love. And certainly the greatest of these is love. And so that's what we'll be talking about today. And this week as I was pondering the topic of love, um, I was reminded of a story in Scripture that, that Jesus, uh, that he went through, and it was really all about love. And, and this week was kind of a, a crazy week for me personally. Um, had, a, had a road trip with uh, some of the interns here and then spent uh, the last day and a half out uh, at a Royal Ranger camp out, which was a great time. But as I'm thinking through these things, this, this section of Scripture really stood out to me as how we should be loving people that are around us. So we're going to start in Luke chapter 10 and verse 25. It says, then an expert in the law stood up to test him. An expert in the law. What, what would we call an expert in the law this day and age? What do we call them? And lawyers, right? So here's a lawyer. How many people love lawyers? I mean, if you're married to one, you better raise your hand. Come on. Um, I mean, we, generally speaking, we don't, we don't like lawyers that much. And, uh, and I mean, there's some great ones out there. We have a great one. But, uh, but here, here's a lawyer. And what do lawyers do for a living? They look for loopholes. They argue with people. They research things. They try to trip up people, such things as that. And here is an expert in the law, and he stood up to do what? To test him, to test Jesus. And, and here's this well-educated guy. He's like, you got, guys, I argue for a living. I will shut this teacher up once and for all. Just let me at it. I'm going to trip him up. I'm going to test him. And, and, and this is going to be fun. Everybody watch. So the lawyer stands up and says, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So he's kind of throwing out this baited question because everybody had different perspectives on this. But Jesus, who, who was known for not answering questions, people would ask him questions and he would never answer them. And, and I'm sure it was probably pretty annoying. People would ask Jesus a question and he would turn around and ask them a question. It's like, you know, people say like, you know, uh, how's your day today? And he'd be like, well, how's your day today? You know, it's like, it's like, come on, Jesus, can I get a straight answer out of you? You know, Jesus, are you hungry? Well, are you hungry? You know, I mean, he's always turning these questions right back around to the person who asked it. So, so here's this lawyer says, teacher, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, what is written in the law? He asked him, and how do you read it? So right, right from the beginning, he turns it back onto the lawyer. And now the lawyer is probably caught off guard a little bit, and he has to answer this. So he gives a rather brilliant answer, actually. The lawyer answers, he says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Now, these were very wise words that he said, because Jesus had said many things very similar to this, all throughout it. Jesus talked a lot about loving God and, and loving others. And in your notes, you can jot that down. That if you love God and you love people, you'll ace the whole test. I mean, I mean, this is such a critical thing. Because these people, these lawyers, these, these Jews, the religious leaders, they had all these rules and regulations. In fact, if you study it, you find out they had about 613 rules that they had to follow. We know some of them, the 10 most famous, we call them the 10 commandments, but they had many, 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 many rules and laws that they had to 
live by. So imagine going to school, you're sitting in your class, your teacher hands you a test, and in this test is, yes, 613 questions. And you're like, here you go, good luck. But before you start the test, there's two questions. They're kind of like extra credit questions. And if you get these two questions right, you don't even have to bother taking the rest of the test because we know that you understand the information and the rest of the test. So that's what these two things were like. It's like if you have a mortgage and you got like 28 years left on this mortgage and you're like, I got to pay this down. I got to pay it every month. And then the mortgage company contacts you and says, hey, guess what? We're running a promotion and we want to inspire people to pay their mortgage on time. And if you pay your mortgage payment on time for the next two months, We'll just send you the title deed. You don't have to pay the rest. And we'll be like, okay, yeah, where do I sign up for that? It's not real. I just made it up. So don't, like some people are like Googling it right now. How do I do this? But see, what's going on here is, is, is this lawyer gives this answer, and it really is a great answer because what he's saying fulfills all of the laws. Jesus never said that he came to replace the laws, but the teachings that he gave showed us how we can fulfill these laws, how we can live our lives by them by simply loving God and loving other people. And if you love God and love other people, you're automatically going to live a life according to these laws. You know, I wonder if you've ever loved someone with your all. If you've ever loved someone unconditionally. And before you just jump in your head saying, yeah, yeah, of course I do. I love my kids unconditionally. I love my parents unconditionally. I love my girlfriend unconditionally. Before you say it, let's just think about it for a moment. Because I asked some friends of mine this, and I was asking myself this question as well. I'm like, like, like how much do you love these people? And they're like, oh, we love them unconditionally. I'm like, okay, well, you love your kid unconditionally. I'm like, but what if they like, what if they like took your cat and like, like, you know, got it lost out in the woods. And they're like, yeah, I'd love my kid even more if they did that, you know? No, but like, like, what if your kid, you know, burns your house down? Okay, well, you know, that would not be good. And, and what, what if your kid went, went to the place that you work and, and they, they start, you know, talking to your boss and say, you should, hi, you should fire, you know, my mom or my dad or whatever. And they do everything they can to ruin and destroy your life. Most of us at some point were like, you know what? Like, I love you unconditionally, but to a point. <laughs> Which isn't really unconditionally, is it? Like, I love you to a point, but you know how to push my buttons. A lot of times, husbands and wives are like this. Our relationships with our parents are like this. I love you unconditionally, but man, if you push me too far, then my love for you will be less. Or I will love you at a distance, because I'm going to remove myself from this. I love you, but only to a point. And here the lawyer is saying, we should love people as we love ourselves. You know, if you love me, you're going to treat me with respect. Speaking of which, today is our third anniversary, and we got a, uh, an anniversary present this morning. As, as we came into church, I get a phone call from Lenny, and, uh, and he's saying, hey, did you move the guitars in the green room over here? I'm like, no. He's like, well, they're all gone. I'm like, really? And, and so as, uh, to make a long story short, we came in, and sure enough, the guitars were gone. We had somebody break in uh, over the last couple days and help themselves to, uh, to two of my guitars and two of George's guitars. And, um, and it gave us an opportunity. You know, it's, here's the thing. Like I said, this week's been kind of crazy. And even this morning, I was praying, like, you know, God, like, I really want a, a good object lesson, a good illustration for how to love people. And then I come in, and my guitars are stolen, and I'm like, God, like, okay. Like, I didn't mean like this, actually. I meant like, you know, an, like, like a bouncy ball like we had last week. I'm not talking about <clears throat> losing something. But it gives us the opportunity to love people. And we pray for them, we forgive them, and, and we hope that God uses this, you know, to really just convict them and bring them here to church. And, and whether we get the guitars back or not, I, I really don't care. I'd like to get my bass back because it has some sentimental value. But otherwise, like, God bless them, and I forgive them, and I love them. But you know what? I don't think they love me very much. Because if they loved me, they wouldn't have stolen my guitars. If they loved George, they wouldn't have stolen them. Because when we love people, we, we naturally... We'll live our lives 
by God's laws. Imagine how your relationships would be different if you love people the way you love yourself. If we love people the way we love ourselves, man, that could revolutionize our world because we love ourselves a lot. Some people say, well, I don't love myself a lot. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe not. But you get pulled over on the side of the road, right, and, and you were speeding or something, you're speeding, cop pulls you over. I'm like, man, I just don't love myself. Just arrest me, officer. No, of course not. You're like, please show me mercy. Please forgive me. I'm sorry. I, I was going too fast. I was, you know, doing something. I, my, my mind was, you know, wandering, and I was going too fast. Please show me mercy. He said, okay, I'll show you mercy. And then we're driving down the road, and somebody, you know, zigging, zigzagging throughout the road, and they, they blow by you, and then you see a cop pull over out behind him. You're like, yeah, you get him. You know, you, you pull him over, lock him up, and throw away the key, because a lot of times... We want to be forgiven, but we don't like to show forgiveness so much. We want God to show us mercy, but we don't want to show mercy to others. We want people to be tolerant of us, yet we don't want to tolerate them. And, and that always baffles me. People are like, I just want you to tolerate me. I, why you're so intolerant, I'm just so intolerant of people that are intolerant. I'm like, well, doesn't that make you intolerant also? Because I think true tolerance would be able to tolerate people that are intolerant, wouldn't it? I mean, that's just a simple thought that I have. But write this in your notes, that if you want people to tolerate you, you got to start by tolerating them. we got to start by showing love to other people. We have this tendency, we always want to get more than we give. We want to get more than we give. But in your notes, jot this down, that you can't be selfish when you love your neighbor as yourself. You can't be selfish, because if I'm loving you as I love me, I'm putting your interest above my own. I'm not being selfish when I, when I try to help you, when I reach out to you. We can't be selfish when we do this. And selfishness is the root of all sin. But here is Jesus, and he's talking with this lawyer. And the lawyer gives this good answer. And Jesus simply says in verse, uh, verse 28, he said, You've answered correctly, he told them. Do this, and you will live. Next verse. But wanting to justify himself. Again, this is a lawyer we're talking about. Like, like he's not done yet. Like, he should have just stopped and walked away. But he's like, no, no, no. I, I, he, he wants to justify himself. Like, what do you mean? Like, I just gave you an answer saying I should love everybody, but I really don't want to do it. So, I, so Jesus, so, come on, man. Who's my neighbor anyway? Like, come on. Like, I can, I can love my, my, my neighbor, my next door neighbor. Come on. Who, who's my neighbor? He's looking for a loophole here. He wants you to say, oh, well, I just mean, you know, love the people that are like you. See, the Good Samaritan story that we often hear is actually Jesus' response to the lawyer's loophole. The lawyer is lo looking for a loophole, and Jesus instead tells a story. The lawyer says, and who is my neighbor? And again, Jesus doesn't directly answer the question. He just says, once upon a time, there was a Jewish man, and he was going on a journey. And everybody's like, okay, it's story time with Jesus again. And so Jesus starts telling this story about this man, a Jewish man, going on a journey, and he gets beat up, robbed, and left on the side of the road for dead. And as this man is lying there, left for dead, a priest happens to come by. And the priest is coming by, and the priest, I mean, these are like the pastors of the day. They're the religious leaders. They're, they're the prominent and important people. They're the ones that epitomize faith in God. And this priest comes by, and, and Jesus says, and he crossed to the other side of the road and keeps on going. And I wonder, he must have been like, oh, you know what? Uh, there's a guy, that, let me act like I'm praying, and now no one will expect me to stop. Oh, God, please help me to draw closer to you. And he's like, oh, okay, I think I'm far enough now. I don't have to stop. And this priest keeps just blows right by this guy, doesn't even stop to help him. Then a Levite 
comes by. The Levites were like the temple assistants. They were the ones who cooked and cleaned and, and sang music and all this stuff. They were the ones there that you know, were very influential in their communities. And here is this Levite, and he does the same thing. He crosses it, tries to look around, around another way, keeps moving. I wonder, have you ever done that before? Like, like, like you're in a, in, a, in a mall maybe, and you see somebody off in the distance, and you recognize them before they recognize you. Do you know what I'm saying? And, and you're like, I don't want to talk to that person. <laughs> like, that person is annoying, or they're going to make me talk for all this time. And, and so we're like crouched down, hiding behind a display rack of like skirts, and the little kid's like, excuse me, mister, what are you doing? Like, shut up, kid, and act like I'm not here. You know, and they walk around, and I'm like kind of scooting over, like, I don't want to talk with you right now. I, I'm trying to avoid. I wonder if you've ever done that, or if I'm the only one. I might be the only one. I don't know. But that's what this guy was doing. The priest and the Levite, they said, oh, I, I didn't see anything. I didn't see anybody laying there on the side of the road. But it's interesting, the priest and the Levite, these are the kind of people that everyone would want to have as their neighbor, and they didn't help. I mean, if you're going and you're looking for land in this day and age and, and you find a house and on one side, one of your neighbors is a priest and the other side of the house, the neighbor is a Levite, you'd be like, I want to live there because now I know I'll have good neighbors. But they didn't stop and help. I, I wonder, have you ever been shocked about the people in your life who didn't stop to help? Like you're going through something and they're like, I'll be there for you. All you got to do is call. And you call and they're like, what? Who? Who are you? I don't know who you are, click. Like I'm not going to help you. Or, or they'll say, okay, I'll be praying for you. Like, okay, that, that's nice. But really what I needed was I needed a ride right now. I didn't need you to pray for me. I needed a ride. I wonder if there's people in your life like that that have passed you on the other side. person that you knew would be there for you and they weren't there. And then Jesus says, then along comes a good Samaritan. In that culture, that was an oxymoron. There was no such thing as a good Samaritan. Samaritans were all evil. They were bad. The Jews and the Samaritans did not socialize. In fact, at one point in time, someone was really angry at Jesus, so much so, and in John 8, they called him a Samaritan devil. They're like, this is double bad. You're like a Samaritan and a devil mixed up together, and that's what you are, a Samaritan devil. The lawyer must have heard Good Samaritan, and, and he's like, what is he talking about? There is no such thing, because the Jews would have no dealings with Samaritans. In fact, Jesus one time was at a well, and there was a woman there, and she was from Samaria, and he went up and started talking to her, and she's like, hold on, you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan. You should not be talking to me. But Jesus, just to drive his point home, says, but then there's this, Good Samaritan who comes and he sees the man on the side of the road. And unlike the priest and the Levite, he doesn't walk by. He stops. He goes over to him. He cleans him up. He bandages him up. He puts him on his donkey, takes him to a hotel, pays all of his expenses until he can recover. And then he looks to the lawyer and says, so tell me, answers the question with the question. So, Mr. Lawyer, tell me who was this man's neighbor. This must have killed the lawyer to say, in fact, in fact, he doesn't say, oh, it was the Samaritan. He just says, the one who showed him mercy. Like, he didn't even want to utter the word Samaritan. Just saying, who is his neighbor? And your notes shot this down. The good Samaritan was someone that they wouldn't have wanted as their neighbor. They wouldn't want, you know, you go into town and you see a Samaritan lives there and you're like, you know what, I'm going to keep looking. I don't want this guy to be my neighbor. Listen to what Jesus says in John 13. He actually raises the bar even higher. He says, so now I'm giving you a new commandment to love each other. And then he goes on, he says, just as I have loved you, you should love each other. See, the lawyer, he said, oh, we should love our neighbors as ourselves," And we should, but God raises the bar here. Jesus raises the bar and says, no, don't just love each other like you love yourself. Love them as I've loved you. 
Verse 35, because your love for one another will prove to the world that you're my disciples. When, when people look at you in your life, what, what proves to them that you're following Jesus? So many times people look at people that call themselves Christians or in the church and they say, oh, they're just judgmental, they don't love people, they're hypocritical, they're this, they're that, all negative things. But Jesus is saying, if you want to show people that you're my disciple, it's not about what you wear, it's not about how you talk, it's not about you know, any of that stuff, it's about how you show love to other people. In your notes, jot this down, that the thing that distinguishes you from everyone else should be the way you love others. That should be the distinguishing factor. How do we love other people? Well, they don't deserve to be loved. I know they don't deserve to be loved. You don't deserve to be loved either. But God still loves you. Jesus still loves you. And he didn't say, love them the way they deserve to be loved. He said, love them as I have loved you. And you didn't deserve it, so turn around and love them the same way. But instead, people, they want to follow Jesus. They want to call themselves a Christian. And they replace love for a ritual and a routine and a religion. I'm just going to go through and I'm just going to jump through all these hoops. I'm going to pray. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to go to church. But none of these things are a substitute for how I love other people and how I treat them and how I love God. And unfortunately, this is why some people haven't ever come to a church or, or won't go to a church because they've met too many Christians, unfortunately. And they don't read the Bible because maybe the meanest person they've met or the meanest person in their life is someone who claims to be following Christ, but they aren't showing it in their actions. In John 4, uh, 1 John 4, 7, and he says, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another. For love from, comes from God, and anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who, underline these next few words, anyone who does not love God does not know God. I'm sorry, who, who does not love. If you don't love other people, then you don't know God. For God is love. Skipping down to verse 20, it says, If someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. If I came up this morning and said, you know, somebody robbed me of my guitar, and I hate them, I hope they rot in hell, then you can look at me and say, you know what? You don't love God either. Because that is not acceptable behavior. It says, if anyone says, I love God, but... I, I, but hates another person, that person's a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we can't see? And he's given us this command, those who love God must also love their fellow believers. So in your notes, write down that, that if you want to be like Jesus, you're going to have to learn how to love like him. You're going to have to learn how to love people that are far away, that are different. You're going to have to learn how to love people who look different, that dress different, that have a different skin color, different nationality. You're going to have to learn how to love people that vote differently, that think differently, that dress differently, that have different hairstyles than you. If you're going to really follow Jesus, you're going to have to love people that are extremely different from yourself. And I think God judges us more on that, how we love people that are unlike us than just about anything else because when I love someone it starts to change my heart and my mind it helps me to 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 walk the extra mile for them when I love someone it gives me this strength and the courage to call someone who maybe I burned a bridge with many years before and make restitution because in your notes write this down that this this commandment this love love does not have loopholes and we look for loopholes. The lawyer was looking for loopholes. Well, you say love everybody, but, but who exactly is everybody? Like, I'm not supposed to love everybody, am I? And, and you get online, you get on the internet, on Facebook. You guys on Facebook? Anybody on Facebook? People on Facebook are crazy, aren't they? And you're like, I don't want to read. I'm on Facebook. I'm crazy, too. I'm not saying, I'm not just pointing the finger here. You get on there and people are crazy. Everybody's like, oh, I hate this and I hate that and I can't believe this person to this and I can't believe this person to that and oh, these people over here on this side are, are horrible human beings. And I'm like, man, if we would just show a little bit of love, maybe our country would be a better place to be. If we just show a little bit of love to people that are different from me, if I'd show a little bit of love to someone who voted differently than me, 
This is an ironclad thing, though. You know, Jesus couldn't even get out of loving everybody because we see right before he was crucified on the cross, he's in the garden begging God, saying, God, if there's any way I can get out of this, like, let's do it. And he asked God three times, like, let me get out of it. And God's like, no, let me get out of it. No, let me get out of it. No, okay. And he goes forward, and he was nailed to the cross. And, and, uh, and it wasn't the nails that held Jesus to the cross. And it wasn't the cross that held him up there. And I've heard people preach before say, oh, it was my sin that held Jesus to the cross. And I say, no way, man. Your sin is not strong enough to hold Jesus to the cross. It was his love and his love alone that held him to the cross. He held himself there by his love for me because he knew I would be a screw-up. He said, I love you so much that I'm going to stay here. He could have pulled right off of that thing if he wanted to, but he didn't out of love for us. So jot this in your notes that God demands that we broaden our ability to love. He wants us to broaden it. He wants us to love people that we used to think we never could love. And maybe in your life, your ability to love is being tested. You know, mine was tested a little bit this morning, and maybe you're having a situation in your life with a friend, a family member, a coworker, a boss, an employee, someone that, that's really testing your ability to love, your, your ability to understand, and God wants to expand your perspective today so that you can love other people. This is why it's important that we don't look down on anyone that comes in through these doors. Every single week, we gather together for prayer before church, and I challenge everybody this year. I was like, don't forget to show love to every person that comes in. We want to be known for showing love to people. You might not understand them. You might not know why they act a certain way, dress a certain way, vote a certain way, live their life a certain way, but we're still called to love them because there's people that come week in and week out that are in more pain than you can even imagine. You know, Jesus was walking down the road one day and, and they grabbed this woman and they threw her in the street. She had been caught in the act of adultery. And the religious leaders gathered around according to their laws and their customs. She should be stoned to death. So they all grabbed stones and said, hey, Jesus, why don't you come over and help us out? Stone this lady. You know it's required by the law. So let's do it. Let's get you in on this, Jesus. And he came over and he knelt down and he was doodling in the sand something. And then he looks up and he just says, sure, let's stone her. But first, let whoever doesn't have sin here throw the first stone. Man, that, that whole conversation just got really awkward. And all these priests are looking around like, if I throw that stone, I... I know I've, I have sin, and one by one they drop their stones and walk off, and Jesus says, you know what? Go and sin no more. But the thing that's interesting is he set that standard. He says, Who, whoever doesn't have sin, you be the one to pass judgment. And that eliminates me because I've sinned. And it, I'm guessing it probably eliminates you as well. God wants us to show love, not judgment towards people. That's why we're not interested in just behavior modification, fixing someone's behavior on the outside. No, let God transform you from the inside through reading scripture, through studying his word. In Colossians 3, 12, it says, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with Christian t-shirts, right? <laughs> we gotta wear the little fish on the shirt and that's how people will know that I'm a Christian. You know, I gotta have the little fish on my car. I don't have a fish on my car. There's a reason for that. If I ever happen to be driving crazy out there, I don't want somebody to be like, look at that crazy Christian driver. And I, I don't try to drive crazy, don't get me wrong, but uh, I don't want to do anything that's going to give him a bad name in that regards to my driving. Anyway, that, that wasn't in my notes. That, that one was free. Um, he says, clothe yourselves, not with a Christian t-shirt. He says, clothe yourselves with tender heart and mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Next verse, underline this next word, make allowance. Underline that word allowance. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Do you make allowance for other people's faults or are we just looking out to catch somebody? It says make allowance for their faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love. 
which binds us all together in perfect harmony. We need to make allowance for other people's faults. What this is talking about is saying, I, I'm kind of expecting people to let me down. And it's okay. I'm going to make allowance for that. I'm going to cover over that. Because I realize that the more mercy that I can show other people, the more mercy I can receive from God. That I shouldn't expect them to, to be gracious to me if I'm not gracious to them first. Love covers a person's faults. That's why we shouldn't be gossiping. Gossiping is the opposite of that. Talking about somebody, exploiting somebody's faults, their mistakes, their their dirty secrets. That's what much of the media does in this day and age. They're just exploiting somebody's faults. And God's saying, you should make allowance for their faults. Cover over that. Don't talk bad about them. Almost every religion in the world is based on this fundamental principle that, that we need to move closer towards keeping more rules. Because it's easier to go through a checklist and check off all the rules that we kept. It's easier to check off a checklist than it is to actually love somebody that's difficult to love. It's easy to love people you like, sure. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about loving the person who is so unlike you that you have nothing in common, but being able to see that they are still made in the image of God and that he loves them, and that he wants to love them through you to cross these aisles, to cross these barriers, to cross these chasms. Man, our country would be in a different place than it is now if people would show love rather than exploiting somebody's problems. The last thing in your notes is this, that Jesus wants us to be identified as his followers by the way that we love each other. When people look at you, are they like, man, there's something different about you. You are just so loving to everybody you meet. You're just so kind and compassionate. And and you know what? That guy voted differently than you, and you still love them. You still help them. They're a different ethnicity than you, and you still love them and care for them. But the reason why so many people give up on on Christians is because so many of them in this world are walking around undressed or halfway dressed. It says, clothe yourselves with love. And they're like, well, I'm not so sure that fits me right. I'd rather clothe myself with being judgmental and angry. No, let's clothe ourselves with love. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you now. We come to you humbly and we thank you for loving us so much. Lord, help us to love others in return. Help us to love those that are so different from us, that have different perspectives and different attitudes and different beliefs. Help us to love them as you have loved me. And as we continue to pray, there may be some of you here today that you've never fully put your faith and trust and hope in God. You've never experienced his love for you. In fact, maybe you've chased this sensation of love by all kinds of things, relationships and chemicals and and money and, and, and fame and popularity and all kinds of things. And, And God's saying to you right now, no, those things aren't gonna give you the love that you need. You need to come to me. Come to me, you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. And Scripture says that any of us who believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, and we say with our mouth that Jesus is my Lord, that we will be saved. And if that's where you are today, say, I commit myself to God, then say those words, Jesus, you are my Lord. And I put my faith and hope and trust in you. Lord, help us to show love. Let us love the unlovable. Bring them here into this church. Fill up these chairs with the people nobody else wants. Fill them up so that we can show love to these people. Give us opportunities this week to show love to even the unlovable. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's stand together.